A Fond Kiss by Robert Burns Recorded for LibriVox.org by Robert Garrison A Fond Kiss, and then we sever A Farewell, alas, forever Deep in heart-wrung tears I'll pledge thee Warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee Who shall say that fortune grieves him? While the star of hope she leaves him. Me, natureful twinkle lights me, Dark despair around be nights me. I'll ne'er blame my partial fancy, Nathing could resist my Nancy. But to see her was to love her, Love but her and love forever. Had we never loved say kindly, Had we never loved say blindly, Never met or never parted, we had ne'er been broken hearted. Fare thee weel, thou first and fairest, fare thee weel, thou best and dearest. Thine be ilka joy and treasure, peace, enjoyment, love, and pleasure. A fond kiss, and then we sever, a farewell, alas, forever. Deep in heart-wrung tears I'll pledge thee, Warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee. End of poem Borrowing from the French by Ralph Waldo Emerson Read for LibriVox.org by Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com some of the hurts you have cured, and the sharpest you still have survived. But what torments of grief you endured from evils which never arrived. Recorded March 15, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. Brahma by Ralph Waldo Emerson Read for LibriVox.org by Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com If the Red Slayer thinks he slays, or if the slain think he is slain, they know not well the subtle ways. I keep and pass and turn again. Far or forgot to me is near, Shadow and sunlight are the same. The vanished gods to me appear, And one to me are shame and fame. They reckon ill who leave me out, When me they fly, I am the wings, I am the doubter and the doubt, And I the hymn the Brahmin sings. The strong gods pine for my abode, and pine in vain the sacred seven. But thou, meek lover of the good, Find me, and turn thy back on heaven. Recorded March twelfth, two 2006. This recording is in the public domain. Clancy of the Overflow by Andrew Barton Banjo Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by James Lord I had written him a letter which I had, for want of better knowledge, sent to where I met him, down the Lachlan years ago. He was shearing when I knew him, so I sent the letter to him, just on spec, addressed as follows, Clancy of the Overflow. And an answer came directed in a writing unexpected, and I think the same was written in a thumbnail dipped in tar. "'Twas his sharing mate who wrote it, and verbatim I will quote it. clancy has gone to Queensland droving, and we don't know where he are. "'In my wild erratic fancy, visions come to me of Clancy, "'gone a-droving, down the Cooper, where the western drovers go. "'As the stocker slowly stringin', Clancy rides behind them singin', "'for the driver's life has pleasures that the townsfolk never know. "'And the bush hath friends to meet him.' and their kindly voices greet him, in the murmur of the breezes, and the river on its bars. And he sees the vision splendid, of the sunlit plains extended, and at night, the wondrous glory, 
of the everlasting stars. I'm sitting in my dingy little office where a stingy ray of sunlight struggles feebly down between the houses tall and the fetid air and gritty of the dusty, dirty city through the open window floating spreads its foulness over all. And in place of lowing cattle, I can hear the fiendish rattle of the tramways and the buses making hurry down the street and the language uninviting of the gutter children fighting comes fitfully and faintly through the ceaseless tramp of feet. And the hurrying people daunt me, and their pallid faces haunt me, as they shoulder one another in their rush and nervous haste, with their eager eyes and greedy, and their stunted forms and weedy. For townsfolk have no time to grow, they have no time to waste. And I somehow rather fancy that I'd like to change with Clancy, like to take a turn at droving, where the seasons come and go. While he faced the round eternal of the cash book and the journal. But I doubt he'd suit the office, Clancy of the Overflow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marlo Diane, Forbidden Dragon. Blogspot. Com. The Cremation of Sam McGee, by Robert Service. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen such queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake Labarge I cremated Sam McGee. Now Sam McGee was from Tennessee, where the cotton blooms and blows, why he left his home in the south to roam round the pole, God only knows. He was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell though he'd often say in his homely way that he'd sooner live in hell. On a Christmas day we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold through the parka's fold, it stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes we'd closed and the lashes froze till sometimes we couldn't see, it wasn't much fun but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we lay packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, and the dogs were fed, and the stars o'erhead were dancing heel and to toe, he turned to me and cap says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess, and if I do, I'm asking that you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seems so low that I couldn't say no, then he says with a sort of moan, it's the cursed cold, and it's got right hold till I'm chilled clean through to the bone. Yet taint being dead, it's my awful dread of the icy grave that pains. So I want you to swear that foul or fair you'll cremate my last remains. A pal's last need is a thing to heed, so I swore I would not fail. And we started on at the streak of dawn, but God, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched on the sleigh, and he raved all day of his home in Tennessee. And before nightfall a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death, and I hurried, horror-driven, with a corpse half-hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed to the sleigh, and it seemed to say you may tax your brawn and brains, but you promise true, and it's up to you to cremate those last remains. Now a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern code. In the days to come, though my lips were dumb, in my heart how I cursed that load. In the long, long night, by the lone firelight, while the huskies, round in a ring, howled out their woes to the homeless snows, O oh God, how I loathe the thing! And every day that quiet clay seemed to heavy and heavier grow, and on I went, though the dogs were spent and the grub was getting low. The trail was bad, and I felt half mad, but I swore I would not give in. And I'd often sing to the hateful thing, and it hearkened with a grin. Till I came to the marge of Lake Labarge, and a derelict there lay. 
It was jammed in the ice, and I saw in a trice it was called the Alice May. And I looked at it, and I thought a bit, and I looked at my frozen chum. Then here, said I, with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some planks I tore from the cabin floor, and I hit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was lying around, and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared, and the furnace roared such a blaze you seldom see. And I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal, and I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike, for I didn't like to hear him sizzle so. And the heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the wind began to blow. It was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks, and I don't know why. And the greasy smoke in an inky cloak went streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grimly fear. But the stars came out, and they danced about, ere again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a peep inside. I guess he's cooked, and it's time I looked, then I opened the door wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm, in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile, you could see a mile, and he said, please close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you'll let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen such queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see. Was that night on the marge of Lake La Barge I cremated Sam McGee? End. Recorded by Marlo Diane. March twenty third, two thousand and six. Piscid West, Prince Edward Island. A Dream Within a Dream by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Robert Garrison Take this kiss upon the brow, And in parting from you now, Thus much let me avow. You are not wrong who deem That my days have been a dream. Yet if hope has flown away In a night or in a day, In a vision or in none, Is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem Is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar Of a surf-tormented shore, And I hold within my hand Grains of the golden sand. How few, yet how they creep Through my fingers to the deep, While I weep, while I weep. O oh God, can I not grasp Them with a tighter clasp? O oh God, can I not save One from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem But a dream within a dream? End of poem Forbearance by Ralph Waldo Emerson Read for LibriVox.org By Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com Hast thou named all the birds without a gun? Loved the wood rose and left it on its stalk. At rich men's tables, eaten bread and pulse. Unarmed, faced danger with a heart of trust. And loved so well a high behavior in man or maid that thou from speech refrained, nobility more nobly to repay? O oh, be my friend! And teach me to be thine. Recorded March fourteenth, two thousand six. This recording is in the public domain. Give All to Love by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Read for LibriVox.org by Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com. Give all to love, obey thy heart, 
Friends, kindred, days, estate, good fame, Plans, credit, and the muse, nothing refuse. Tis a brave master, let it have scope, Follow it utterly, hope beyond hope. High and more high, it dives into noon, With wing unspent, untold intent. But it is a god, knows its own path, And the outlets of the sky. It was never for the mean, It requireth courage stout, Souls above doubt, Valor unbending, Such twill reward, They shall return, More than they were, And ever ascending. Leave all for love, Yet hear me yet, One word more thy heart behoved, One pulse more of firm endeavor, Keep thee to-day, To-morrow for ever, Free as an Arab of thy beloved. Cling with life to the maid, but when the surprise, first vague shadow of surmise, flits across her bosom young, of a joy apart from thee, free be she, fancy free, nor thou detain her vesture's hem, nor the palest rose she flung from her summer diadem. Though thou loved her as thyself, as a self of purer clay, Though her parting dims the day, Stealing grace from all alive, Heartily know, when half-gods go, The gods arrive. Recorded March twentieth, two 2006. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Holly Lakatos. Love's Farewell by M. Drayton Since there's no help, come, let us kiss and part. Nay, I have done, you get no more of me, and I am glad, yea, glad with all my heart, that thus so cleanly I myself can free. Shake hands forever, cancel all our vows, and when we meet at any time again, be it not seen in either of our brows that we one jot of former love retain. Now at the last gasp of love's latest breath, when his pulse failing, passion speechless lies, when faith is kneeling by his bed of death, and innocence is closing up his eyes, now if thou wouldst, when all have given him over, from death to life thou mightest him yet recover. End of Love's Farewell The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot Read by Lorena for LibriVox.org Si io credesse che mia risposta fosse a persona che mai tornasse al mondo, questa fiamma staria senza più scosse. Ma per ciò che già mai di questo fondo non torno vivo alcun, si odo il vero, senza tema d'infamia ti rispondo. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go, through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room the woman come and go talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs his back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs his muscle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seen that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, 
rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you, and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room, the woman come and go talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair, they will say. How his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin they will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with the dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the buttons of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are bracelated and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. It is perfume from a dress that makes me so digress, arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say... I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor, here beside you and me, should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But do I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed? Do I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter? I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worth while to have been off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus come from the dead. Come back to tell you all. I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, That is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worth while? After the sunset and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels and the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more, it is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worth while if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window, should say, That is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, 
star is seen or two. Advise the prince. No doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit of twos, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost, at times, the fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled, shall I part my hair behind, do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, Till human voices wake us and we drown. End of poem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Life's A Peace in Bloom. By William Ernest Henley Madame Life's a piece in bloom, Death goes dogging everywhere. She's the tenant of the room, He's the ruffian on the stair. You shall see her as a friend, You shall bilk him once or twice, But he'll trap you in the end, And he'll stick you for her price. With his knee-bones at your chest, and his knuckles in your throat. You would reason, plead, protest, clutching at her petticoat. But she's heard it all before. Well, she knows you've had your fun. Gingerly she gains the door, and your little job is done. End Recorded by Marlo Diane March 24 2006 Piscid West Prince Edward Island A Man's a Man for a uh, That by Robert Burns Recorded for LibriVox.org by Robert Garrison Is there for honest poverty that hangs his head na uh, that the coward slave, we pass him by. We dare be poor for a that. For a that and a that, our toils obscure and a that. The rank is but the guinea stamp, the man's the gowd for a that. What though on hamely fare we dine, wear hodden gray and a that. Ye fools their silks, and knaves their wine, a man's a man for a that. For a that and a that, their tinsel show and a that, the honest man, though e'er say poor, is king o' men for a that. Ye see yon Berkey cod a lord, wha struts and stares and a that, though hundreds worship at his word, he's but a coof for a that. For a that and a that, his ribboned star and a that. The man o' oh, independent mind, he looks and laughs at a' that. A prince can make a belted knight, a marquis duke and a' that. But an honest man's a boon his might, good faith he mona for that. A' that and a' that, their dignities and a' that. The pit o' sense and pride o' worth are higher rank than a' that. Then let us pray that come it may, as come it will for a ah, that, that sense and worth o'er ah, the earth shall bear the gree and a ah, that. For a ah, that and a ah, that, it's coming yet for a ah, that, that man to man the world o'er shall brithers be for a ah, that. End of Poem 
The Owl and the Pussycat by Edward Lear. Read for LibriVox.org by Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com. The Owl and the Pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar, O oh, lovely pussy, O oh, pussy, my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are, what a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married, too long we have tarried, but what shall we do for a ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows, and there in a wood a piggy wig stood with a ring at the end of his nose, his nose, his nose, with a ring at the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? said the piggy, I will. So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mince and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon, and hand in hand on the edge of the sand they danced by the light of the moon, the moon, the moon. They danced by the light of the moon. Recorded March 30th, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. A Red, Red Rose by Robert Burns Recorded for LibriVox.org by Robert Garrison Oh, my love's like a red, red rose That's newly sprung in June Oh, my love's like the melody That's sweetly played in tune As fair art thou, my bonny lass So deep in love am I and I will love thee still, my dear, Till ah the seas gung dry, Till ah the seas gung dry, my dear, And the rocks melt with the sun. I will love thee still, my dear, While the sands o' life shall run. And fare thee weel, my only love, And fare thee weel a while, And I will come again, my love, though it were ten thousand mile. End of poem. Self-Dependence by Matthew Arnold Read by Gabriel Paluzzi for LibriVox.org Weary of myself, and sick of asking what I am and what I ought to be, at this vessel's prow I stand, which bears me forwards, Forwards o'er the starlit sea. And the look of passionate desire, O'er the sea and to the stars I send, Ye who from my childhood up have calmed me, Calm me, ah, compose me to the end. Ah, once more I cried, Ye stars, ye waters, On my heart your mighty charm renew. Still, still let me as I gaze upon you, Feel my soul becoming vast like you. From the intense, clear, star-sown vault of heaven, Over the lit sea's unquiet way, In the rustling night air came the answer, Wouldst thou be as these are? Live as they, Unaffrighted by the silence round them, Undistracted by the sights they see. These demand not that things without them Yield them love, amusement, sympathy, And with joy the stars perform their shining, and the sea its long moon-silvered roll. For self-poise they live, nor pine with noting all the fever of some differing soul. Bounded by themselves, and unregardful in what state God's other works may be. In their own tasks all their powers pouring, these attain the mighty life you see. O oh, airborne voice, long since severely clear, a cry like thine in mine own heart I hear. Resolve to be thyself. 
and know that he who finds himself loses his misery. End of poem. She Walks in Beauty by Lord Byron Recorded for LibriVox.org This reading by Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com is dedicated to Aiko-san, whose story I still hope to tell some day. She walks in beauty like the night Of cloudless climes and starry skies, And all that's best of dark and bright Meets in her aspect and her eyes, Thus mellowed to that tender light Which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, Had half impaired the nameless grace, Which waves in every raven tress, Or softly lightens o'er her face, Where thoughts serenely sweet express, how pure, how dear their dwelling place. And on that cheek, and o'er that brow, So soft, so calm, yet eloquent, The smiles that win, the tints that glow, But tell of days in goodness spent, A mind at peace with all below, A heart whose love is innocent. Recorded March 16th, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. Smoke by Henry David Thoreau Read for LibriVox.org By Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com Light-winged smoke, a carrion bird Melting thy pinions in thy upward flight, Lark without song, and messenger of dawn, Circling above the hamlets is thy nest. Or else, departing dream and shadowy form, Of midnight vision gathering up thy skirts. By night, star-veiling, and by day, Darkening the light and blotting out the sun. Go thou, my incense, upward from this hearth, And ask the gods to pardon this clear flame. Recorded March 16th, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 130 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Scott Cook My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked, red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet by heaven I think my love is rare, as any she belied with false compare. End of poem. To His Coy Mistress by Andrew Marvel Read by Brett Shand for LibriVox.org Had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime, we would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou, by the Indian Ganges' side, shouldst rubies find. I, by the tide of Humber, would complain. I would love you ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires, and more slow. An hundred years should go to praise thine eyes and on thy forehead gaze, two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest, an age at least to every part. And the last age should show your heart. For, lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at a lower rate. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. 
and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honour turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The graves a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds, pray rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball, and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. End of poem. To My Brother by Siegfried Sassoon Read by Wesley Thompson Smith for LibriVox.org Give me your hand, my brother, search my face. Look in these eyes, lest I should think of shame. For we have made an end of all things base. We are returning by the road we came. Your lot is with the ghost of soldiers dead, And I am in the field where men must fight. But in the gloom I see your laurelled head, And through your victory I shall win the light. End poem.